What is it to have good judgment in politics? What is it to be politically wise or gifted, to be a political genius, or even to be no more than politically competent, to know how to get things done? Perhaps one way of looking for the answer is by considering what we're saying when we denounce statesmen or pity them for not possessing these qualities. We sometimes complain that they're blinded by prejudice or passion. But blinded to what? We say that statesmen don't understand the times they live in. Or that they're resisting something called the logic of the facts. Or that they're trying to put the clock back. Or that history is against them. Or that they're unpractical idealists. Or visionaries. Or utopians. Or persons hypnotized by the dream of some fabulous past. Or some unrealizable future. All such expressions and metaphors seem to presuppose that there is something to know which the, of which the critic certainly has some notion, but which these unfortunate persons have somehow not managed to grasp. This something is presumably the logic of the facts, or the inexorable movement of some cosmic clock which no man can alter, or some pattern of things in time or in space or in some more mysterious medium, what is called the realm of the spirit sometimes, or ultimate reality, which one must first understand if one is to avoid total frustration. But what is this knowledge? Is it knowledge of a science? Are there really laws to be discovered, rules to be learnt? Can states be taught something, something called a political science, the science of the relationships of human beings to each other and to their environment, a science which consists, like other sciences, of systems of verified hypotheses organized under laws, that enable one, by the use of further experiment and observation, to discover other facts and to verify new hypotheses? Is it that? Certainly, that was the notion, either concealed or open, of a great many persons who had views on the subject in the 17th century, a notion that grew more and more powerful in the 18th and 19th centuries. When the natural sciences acquired enormous prestige, and attempts were made to maintain that anything that couldn't be reduced to natural science shouldn't properly be called knowledge at all. The more ambitious and extreme scientists, those who were, for the most part, scientific determinists, used to think that if we were given enough knowledge of the laws of social behavior, and enough knowledge of the state of given human beings at a given time, then one could scientifically calculate how these human beings, or at least large groups of them, say whole societies or classes, would behave under some other given set of circumstances. It was argued, and it seemed reasonable enough at the time, that just as knowledge of mechanics was indispensable to engineers or architects or inventors, so knowledge of social mechanics must be necessary for statesmen, for example. Statesmen who wanted to get large bodies of men to do this or that. There were, of course, less ambitious thinkers who contented themselves by saying that the science of society is really rather more like anatomy. To be a good doctor, they maintained, it is necessary, but not sufficient, to know anatomical theory. One must also know how to apply it to specific cases, to particular patients suffering from particular forms of a particular disease. Now, this certainly can't be wholly learnt from books or professors. It needs a great deal of personal experience and natural aptitude. Nevertheless, neither experience nor natural gifts can ever be a total substitute for the knowledge of a developed science, say, pathology or anatomy. To know only the theory mightn't be enough to enable one to heal the sick, but to be ignorant of the theory was certainly quite fatal. The scientifically inclined philosophers of the 18th century believed most passionately in just such laws. And they tried to account for human behavior wholly in terms of the effects of education, of natural environment, and of the play of appetites and passions. However, this turned out to explain so small a part of the actual behavior of human beings, and that at times when it seemed most in need of explanation, during and after the French Revolution, in fact, they failed so conspicuously to predict and analyze such major phenomena as the growth and violence of nationalism, the uniqueness and the conflicts between various cultures, the causes of wars, the causes of revolutions. They seemed to display so little understanding of what we might broadly call spiritual or emotional life, whether of individuals or of whole peoples, that new hypotheses inevitably entered the field, each of these hypotheses invariably claiming 
to overthrow all the others and to be the last and definitive word on the subject. Messianic preachers, prophets like Saint Simon, like Fourier and Comte, dogmatic thinkers like Hegel and Marx and Spengler, historically minded theologians from Bossuet to Toynbee, the popularizers of Darwin, the adapters of this or that dominant school of psychology, all have attempted to step into the breach, which was caused by the failure of the 18th century philosophers to construct a proper, successful science of society. Each of these new 19th century apostles laid some claim to exclusive possession of the truth. What they all have in common is the belief that there is one great universal pattern and one unique method of apprehending reality and a pattern, knowledge of which, would have saved statesmen many an error and humanity many a hideous tragedy. It was, wasn't exactly denied that such statesmen as, say, Henry IV of France, or, or Richelieu, or Washington, or Pitt, or Bismarck, do seem to have done well enough without this knowledge. Just as bridges were obviously built before the principles of mechanics had been discovered, and diseases had been cured by men who appeared to know no anatomy. Much could be, and had been done, this was admitted, by the inspired guesses of individual men of genius, by their instinctive skills. But it was argued, particularly towards the end of the 19th century, that there was very no need to look to so precarious a source of light. The principles on which these great men acted, even though they may not have known it, so it was maintained, could be extracted and reduced to a proper, accurate science very much as the principles of biology or of mechanics must once have been established. Political judgment need never again, so it was argued, need never again be a matter of instinct and flair and sudden illuminations and strokes of genius which couldn't be analyzed. No, they should henceforth be built upon the solid foundations of indubitable knowledge. This thesis would be more plausible if the newly discovered laws didn't, as a rule, turn out to be either ancient truisms, such as, for example, that most revolutions are followed by reaction, which really comes from not much more than to say that most movements end at some time and are then followed by something else. Either truisms, or else they were constantly being overthrown and violently overthrown by events, which used to leave the theoretical system in sad ruins. Perhaps nobody really did so much to undermine confidence in a dependable science of human relations as the great tyrants of our day, Lenin, Stalin, Hitler. If belief in the laws of history and scientific socialism really did help Lenin or Stalin, and I expect it did, it helped them not so much as a form of knowledge, but in the way that a fanatical faith in almost any dogma can be of help to determine men by justifying ruthless acts and suppressing doubts and scruples. Between them, Stalin and Hitler left scarcely stone on stone of the once splendid edifice of the inexorable laws of history. It's easy enough to arrange the past in a symmetrical way. Voltaire's famous cynical epigram that history is only a pack of tricks that we play upon the dead isn't perhaps quite as superficial as it seems. But a true science must be able not merely to rearrange the past, but to predict the future, to classify facts, to order them in neat patterns isn't quite yet a science. We are told that the great earthquake that destroyed Lisbon in the mid-18th century shook Voltaire's faith in inevitable human progress. Similarly, the great destructive political upheavals of our own time have instilled the most terrible doubts about the feasibility of a reliable science of human behavior, a science for the guidance of men of action, whether they be industrialists or social welfare officers or statesmen. If I am a statesman faced with an agonizing choice of possible courses of action in a critical situation, will I really find it useful, even if I can afford to wait that long for the answer, to employ a specialist in political science to assemble for me from past history all kinds of cases analogous to my situation, from which the specialist must then abstract what all these situations had in common, deriving from it or applying to it special relevant laws of human behavior. The examples for such an induction would, 
because human experience is extremely various, obviously not be practically numerous. And the dismissal from even these not very numerous instances of all that's unique to each, and the retention only of that, which is common, would produce a very thin generalized residue, and one much too unspecific to be of much help in a practical dilemma. But obviously what matters is this particular situation in its full uniqueness. The particular men and events and dangers, the particular hopes and fears which are actively at work in a particular place at a particular time. In Paris in 1791, in Petrograd in 1917, in Budapest in 1956. What makes statesmen, like drivers of cars, successful is they don't think in general terms. That is to say, they don't primarily ask themselves in what respect a given situation is like or is unlike a great many other situations in the long course of human history, which is what historical sociologists or theologians in historical clothing, like Spengler or Toynbee, are fond of doing. Their merit is that they grasp the unique combination of characteristics that constitute this particular situation at this particular moment, this and no other. What they are said to be able to do is to understand the character of a particular movement, of a particular individual, of a unique state of affairs, of a unique atmosphere, or some particular combination of economic, political, personal factors. And we don't readily suppose that this capacity can literally be taught. We speak of such things as exceptional sensitiveness to certain kinds of fact. We resort to metaphors. We speak of some people as possessing antennae, as it were, that communicate to them the specific contours and texture of a particular political or social situation. We speak of the possession of a good political eye, or nose, or ear, of a political sense which love or ambition or hate may bring into play, of a sense that crisis and danger sharpen or perhaps blunt. Something to which experience is crucial, a particular gift, possibly not altogether unlike that of artists or creative writers. We mean nothing occult or metaphysical, we don't mean a magic eye that is able to penetrate into something that ordinary minds can't apprehend. No, we mean something perfectly ordinary, empirical, quasi-aesthetic in the way that it works. The gift we mean entails, above all, a capacity for integrating a vast amalgam of constantly changing, multicolored, evanescent, perpetually overlapping data, too many, too swift, too intermingled, to be caught and pinned down and labeled like so many individual butterflies. To, to integrate in this sense is to see the data as elements in a single pattern, with their implications, to see them as symptoms of past and future possibilities, to see them pragmatically, that is to say, in terms of what you or others can or will do to them, or what they can or will do to others or to you. To seize a situation in this sense one needs to see, to be given a kind of direct, almost sensuous contact with the relevant data. That which makes such writers as, say, Tolstoy or Proust, convey a sense of direct acquaintance with the texture of life. Not just the sense of a chaotic flow of experience, but a highly developed discrimination of what matters from the rest, whether from the point of view of the writer or of the characters he describes. Above all, it's an acute sense of what fits with what. What springs from what? What leads to what? How things seem to vary to different observers? What the effect of such experience may be on them? What the result is of the interplay of human beings and of impersonal forces, geographical or biological, or whatever they may be? What this interplay is likely to be in a concrete situation? It's a sense for what is qualitative rather than quantitative, for what is specific rather than general. It's a species of direct acquaintance, as opposed to a capacity for description, or calculation, or inference. It is what is sometimes called natural wisdom, what is called imaginative understanding, insight, perceptiveness, and what is much more misleadingly called intuition, which suggests, and suggests very dangerously, some supernatural faculty. These things, as opposed to very different virtues, very great as these may be, but different, such as theoretical learning, or theoretical knowledge, erudition, powers of reason, intellectual genius. The quality I am trying to describe 
is that special understanding of public life, or for that matter, private life, which successful statesmen have, whether they are wicked or virtuous. That which, for example, Bismarck, or Talleyrand, or Franklin Roosevelt, or for that matter, smaller persons like Cavour, or Disraeli, or Ataturk had. And it's something which they had in common with the great psychological novelists. Something which is conspicuously lacking in men of more purely theoretical genius, like Newton, or Einstein, or Russell, or even Freud. What are we to call this kind of capacity? Practical wisdom, perhaps, a sense of what will work and what will not. It's a capacity, in the first place, for synthesis rather than analysis. For knowledge in the sense in which trainers know their animals, or parents know their children, or conductors know their orchestras, as opposed to that in which chemists know the contents of their test tubes, or mathematicians know the rules that their symbols obey. Those who lack this, whatever other qualities they may possess, are correctly regarded as politically inept. In the sense in which, say, Joseph of Austria, Joseph II, I mean, of Austria, was inept. And Joseph II was certainly a morally much better man than Bismarck, and certainly much more benevolently disposed towards mankind. The sense in which, say, the Puritans, or James II, or Robespierre, proved to be inept in realizing at least their positive ends. What is it that successful statesmen, like, say, the Emperor Augustus, or Bismarck, knew, and less successful statesmen, like the Emperor Claudius, or Joseph II of Austria, didn't know? The Emperor Joseph, very likely, was much more intellectually distinguished than Bismarck, and the Emperor Claudius certainly knew a great many more facts and even theories than Augustus. But Bismarck had the power of integrating, without stopping to analyze how he does what he does and whether there is a theoretical justification for what he does. Everyone, as I say, must do it, but Bismarck or Augustus did it over a much larger field, against a much wider horizon, against the possibility of many more alternative courses with far greater power, in fact to a degree which is quite correctly described as that of genius. Of course, whatever can be fished out, whatever can be isolated and looked at, should be. I don't want to sound or be obscurantist. I don't want to say, or hint, as some romantic thinkers certainly have, that something is lost in the very act of investigating and bringing to light. That there is some virtue in darkness as such, that the most important things are too deep for words and should be left untouched, that it's in some sense blasphemous uh, to, 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 to enunciate them. I don't believe this at all. I think this is a false and on the whole deleterious doctrine. What can be illuminated, what can be made articulate, what can be incorporated in the proper science should, of course, be so. My argument is that not everything in practice can be, that a great deal can't. After all, the father of sociology, the eminent Auguste Comte himself, certainly knew a great many facts and laws, a great many more than any politician, but his theories today are nothing but a sad, huge, oddly shaped fossil in the stream of knowledge, a kind of curiosity in a museum. Whereas, if I may return to him again, because I think he's perhaps the most successful of all statesmen in the 19th century, what Bismarck did, his policies are, alas, only too potent amongst us still. Why is this? Because I think Bismarck understood something which, let us say, Darwin or Clark Maxwell didn't need to understand. Something about the public medium in which he acted. And he understood it in the way in which sculptors understand stone or clay. He understood, that's to say in this particular case, the potential reactions of relevant bodies of Germans or Frenchmen or Italians or Russians. And understood this without, as far as we know, any conscious inference or careful regard to laws of any kind, laws of history. And he was successful because he had a particular gift of being able to use his experience and his observation in order to guess successfully how things would turn out. Scientists, at least quasi-scientists, don't need this. Their particular training, in fact, quite often makes them peculiarly unfit in this particular respect. Those who are scientifically trained often seem to hold utopian views about politics, precisely because of a belief that the methods which work particularly well in their particular fields will apply to the entire sphere of human action. Or if not this particular method, or this particular model, then some other method, some other model of a more or less similar kind. 
to deny that laboratories or scientific models have something of value for social organization is, of course, sheer obscurantism. But to maintain the more to teach us than any other form of experience is an equally blind form of doctrinaire fanaticism, which has sometimes led to the torture of innocent men by pseudo-scientific monomaniacs in pursuit of what is obviously a millennium. What are we to say about such people? When we say about the men of, say, 1789 in France or, or, or 1917 in Russia, that they're too doctrinaire, that they rely too much on theories, whether 18th century theories like Rousseau's or 19th century theories like Marx's, we don't mean that these particular theories would, may have been defective, but that better ones could, of course, have been discovered. What we mean is the opposite, that theories as such are not really appropriate in such, in these situations. It's rather as if we were to look for a theory of tea tasting, for a science of architecture. The factors to be evaluated are, in these cases, too many. And it is on skill in integrating them, in the sense which I've already spoken, that everything depends, whatever may be our creed or our purpose, whether we be utilitarians or uh, liberals or communists or mystical theocrats or whatever it may be. Science, theories, no doubt do sometimes help. But they cannot be even a partial substitute for a perceptual gift, for a capacity for taking in the temporal pattern of a human situation. A scientifically trained observer can, of course, always analyze this particular social abuse. He can suggest this particular remedy. What he can't do so well as a scientist is to predict what general effects the application of a particular remedy or the elimination of a particular source of misery or injustice is going to have on other, and especially on remote parts of our total social system. We begin by trying to alter what we can see. But the tremors which our action begins sometimes run through the entire depth of our society, run to levels to which we pay no conscious attention. And these levels are stirred, and all kinds of unintended results are produced. It's knowledge of these lower depths, a semi-instinctive knowledge of them, knowledge of the intricate connection between the upper cities and other remoter layers of social or individual life, which perhaps Burke was the first person to emphasize, although, of course, he turned this knowledge to exceedingly reactionary purposes. It's this kind of knowledge that seems an absolutely indispensable ingredient of good political judgment. We are quite right, I think, to be afraid of those bold reformers who are too obsessed by their vision to pay attention to the medium in which they work. People who ignore imponderables, John of Leiden, Puritans, Robespierre, Hitler, Stalin. Because there's a literal sense in which they know not what they do and don't care either. And where I think are quite right to trust the equally bold empiricists, Henry IV of France, Cavour, Lincoln, Masaryk, Franklin Roosevelt, if we are on their side, I mean, because we see that they understand their material rather better. This isn't a contrast between conservatism and radicalism, or a contrast between caution and audacity. It's a con contrast between types of gift. Just as there are differences of gift, so there are different types of folly. Two of these types seem direct contradictories in a very curious and paradoxical way. The paradox is this. In the realm, which one might broadly say is presided over by the natural sciences, certain laws and principles are recognized as having been established by proper methods. That is to say, methods recognized as reliable by scientific specialists. Those who deny or defy these laws are quite rightly uh, regarded as uh, cranks or lunatics, say people who believe in the flat earth or, or, or who don't believe in gravitation. But in ordinary life, and perhaps in some of the humanities, say in things like studies like history or philosophy or law, those are utopian who do place too much faith in laws and methods, which are derived from alien fields, mostly from the natural sciences, and then apply them with great confidence and, on the whole, rather mechanically. The arts of life, and not certainly least of politics, as well as the humane studies, turn out to possess their own special methods their own criteria of success and failure, their own peculiar techniques. Utopianism, lack of realism, bad judgment, here consists not in failing to apply the methods of natural science, but on the contrary, in over-applying them. Here failure comes from resisting that which is best in each field, from ignoring or opposing it, either in favor of some systematic method or principle which claims universal validity, 
say, the methods of natural science, which is what Kant did, or perhaps historical theology or constitutional law, as, for example, say, Burke did, or else from a wish to defy all principles, all methods as such, from simply trying to trust in a lucky star or personal inspiration, which we call irrational behavior. To be rational in his sphere, to display good judgment in it, is to apply and use those methods which have turned out to work best in it. What is rational in a scientist is therefore very often utopian in a historian or a politician, and vice versa. This seems a platitude, and is a platitude perhaps, but it entails consequences that not everybody is ready to accept. Should statesmen be scientific, we are asked? Should scientists be put in authority as Plato or Saint-Simon or H.G. Wells certainly wanted? Equally, we might ask, should gardeners be scientific? Should cooks? Botany helps gardeners. Laws of dietetics may help cooks. But excessive reliance on these sciences will lead them and their clients to their doom. The excellence of cooks and gardeners still depends today, most largely, upon their artistic endowment, and like that of politicians, on their capacity to improvise. Most of the suspicion of intellectuals and politics springs from the belief, not entirely false, that owing to a strong desire to see life in some simple, some symmetrical fashion, they put much too much faith in the beneficent results of applying, applying directly to life, that is, conclusions which are obtained by operations in some theoretical sphere. And this has the corollary, which is a less, often, much too often corroborated by experience, that if the facts, that's to say the behavior of living human beings, are recalcitrant to such experiment, if they resist, the experimenters become annoyed, and they become to alter the facts to fit the theory. And this, in practice, often means a kind of vivisection of societies till they become what the theory originally declared that the experiment should have made them to be. The theory is saved all right, but it saved too high a cost in human suffering. But as it is applied in the first place, ostensibly at least, to save men from the hardships, which, so it's said, more haphazard methods would bring about, the result is obviously self-defeating. So long as there's, there's no science of politics in sight, Attempts to substitute counterfeit science for individual judgment lead to failure. Not only lead to failure, but also discredit the real sciences and undermine faith in human reason. And this is very sad. The passionate advocacy of unattainable ideals may, even if it's utopian, break open the barriers of blind tradition and transform the values of human beings. But the advocacy of pseudo-scientific or other kinds of falsely certified means, the kind of methods that are advertised by metaphysical or other kinds of bogus prospectuses can only do harm. There's a story, and I don't know if it's true, but there is a story, that when the Prime Minister Lord Salisbury was one day asked on what principle he would decide whether in a given case to go to war, he said that he looked at the sky and then he decided whether or not to take an umbrella. If a reliable science of political weather forecasting existed, no doubt this kind of looking at the sky would be condemned, and rightly, as being much too subjective. But for reasons which I try to give, such a science, even if it isn't impossible in principle, is still very far to seek. And to act as if it already existed, or was just around the corner, is an appalling and gratuitous handicap to all political movements, whatever their principles and whatever their purposes, from the most reactionary to the most violently revolutionary. To ask or to preach mechanical precision even in principle, in a field totally incapable of it, is to be blind and to mislead others. Moreover, was always the part played by pure luck, which, mysteriously enough, men of good judgment seem to have rather more often than others. This too is perhaps worth a little thought.